We are live. Sonia, the stage is yours. Uh, I'll let you introduce yourself and the panel and then get into it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, so, uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today, both those of you here at Bioscience LA and then those of you are uh, who are on Hopin online. My name is Sonia Miriam Satayish, and I am a PhD candidate at USC's Conver Convergence Science uh, Institute in Cancer Research, where I specifically focus on building tools for precision medicine and molecular diagnostics. And now I'll turn it over to Kingston. <laughs> Test, 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 test. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Uh, my name is Kingston Mann. I am a lead data scientist at the City of Hope National Medical Center. We are part of the Applied AI and Data Science team, and I'm in the Precision Medicine Division. I'm also a part time research assistant professor at USC. Uh, looking forward to talk about social determinants of health, precision medicine, and uh, how to translate research into real impact in the clinic. I'll go next. I'm Chris Bostic. I'm a partner at a VC firm based here in LA, OCV Partners, and I help lead our healthcare team uh, where we really focus on the intersection of healthcare and technology and try to use the ideas of personalized medicine and targeted approaches to improve health equity. And prior to joining the VC world, I was actually doing my postdoc at Columbia uh, in the Institute of Genomic Medicine where I worked for a PI who was the flagship or one of the PIs on the All of Us program, which is one of the sponsors. Uh, so it's really exciting. To see the worlds combined and working there in a kind of genetics lab really focused on precision genomics. I got an appreciation on why we really need personalized medicine and how it really expands across modalities. So it's not just in drug discovery, but we also need it in how we provide care to patients, how we think about providing care on a treatment level for payers. And I'm really excited to talk about it today. Great. And then Adriana, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Wonderful. I'm sorry that I cannot be there with you in person, perhaps next time. Pleasure uh, seeing you all. My name is Adriana Kekic. I am a pharmacogenomics clinical pharmacy specialist. Just a mouthful to say that I'm a pharmacist trained in genetics. I'm a clinician researcher, so my areas of focus are related to drug response phenotypes um, from the angle of um, including sex and diversity. So I work extensively with patients who have these connective tissue disorders, many of whom are women. I'm also a lecturer, so my um, niche areas are psychopharmacology and cardiovascular drugs. And I'll turn it over to Albers. Thank you. Uh, my name is Albers Madavi. I, uh... I started a company called Protomer Technologies uh, based in Pasadena, California, next to Caltech in 2015. Uh, the company was acquired by Eli Lilly last year. So now I'm a vice president at Lilly. Uh, I actually also couldn't be there in person, unfortunately. Would have really loved to be there actually in person, but I had to come down to our San Diego site. So I'm actually in San Diego right now and calling in for this discussion. Uh, but normally I'm based in Pasadena uh, in Los Angeles. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so the concept of personalized medicine as a whole, do you guys think about it in terms of it being a breakthrough, an innovation in um, kind of uh, for the development of um, therapeutics or diagnostics? Or is it more so a gradual improvement of techniques in both treatment and diagnostic methods? I can address first. Um, the way I see it being applied clinically today is really more of the latter. It's a collection of little breakthroughs that um, suggest specific treatments based on specific, for example, variants of known interest. And uh, I, I, I think we're still missing an overall breakthrough that is a... Um, uh, it's a, a, a fundamental or a um, one that addresses all kinds of variants of unknown significance, which still greatly outnumber the known. So I think right now it's still a piecemeal process. We're in progress still. 
second go, I, I very much agree. I think it's much more of a gradual transition. Uh, it's something of a way of thinking, of getting better, of moving from a one size fits all approach. You know, when you don't know the biology as well, you find what works on the larger swaths of the population before you really dive in. And then there's some historical analysis we see in some, you know, of the really great treatments. And usually it's oncology that spearheads the way into thinking about uh, more of a personalized approach. And then we leverage those technologies and further indications. Uh, but you go back to things like Herceptin and, you know, negative breast cancers and how, you know, we had right treatments that existed. Uh, and we just did not know where to put them. And it took a lot of effort. And I'm actually, we're investors in Dr. Dennis Slamman, who really spearheaded the work there. Uh, so really bullish to hear about that story or just think about it. But, you know, you have the right drug, but if you don't know the patient population, the right drug looks like a bad drug. And we're continuing to iterate on this process now as we learn more and more about the biology, we learn more biomarkers that we can use. We continue to add on to our data set and then get more towards, you know, how can I treat populations quicker and not start with a one size fits all, but really work bottoms up on an individual level. But it's going to be a stepping stone approach to get there. Excellent. Sonia, I love your question, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle it maybe before Abor <laughs> has a sure. chance. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually two things, two thoughts come to mind. The first thing, I love that you're using the term personalized medicine more so than precision medicine, even though we are really um, kind of embedded in this uh, era of precision medicine, not yet personalized medicine, since there is a distinction between the two. But let's say that we're using them interchangeably. The concept itself is not new. Um, it's not novel. Medicine has always uh, strived to be individualized or personalized. I think what we're seeing right now is both evolution of medicine and revolution, supporting that evolution, revolution through these technologies. And I think really what got us started there are advances in DNA sequencing. And of course, now we're talking about, you know, leveraging AI and machine learning and deep learning to really better understand phenotypes across the population, within the population, and then stratify them which is where that term precision medicine really now comes in, and then hopefully understand biology better so we can uh, treat and cure diseases. Yeah, I guess I was, when I was thinking about this, and those are all really good points, I was thinking about, you know, are we talking about more um, efforts that inform in discovery or efforts that inform in, in clinical practice? And those are two really different discussions, right? So. I think when we think about development of novel modalities and drugs, uh, the discovery side is pretty exciting. Uh, on the uh, on the patient's side, uh, in, in the sense of what we are already using right now, I could think of one example, which is, you know, people use uh, CGMs and, and insulin pumps all the time. And I really think of that as, in some ways, a personalized medicine, because you really tailor the, the injection times and, you know, how many units of insulin you're injecting to really how you feel. And, and in some ways, I think those devices are also enabling the personalization of a therapy that is everybody gets the same pump, but they may have a very different experience with that pump system or CGM. And they can you know choose which CGM to use and pair which, 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 which pump. And so I think from that perspective, there is that area where people are very interested in personalization. And then the other part, which you guys mentioned, which I think is really important also, is how do we develop new medicines that are personalized in the way that we actually develop them, right? And, and how we discover them. And so those, to me, are two vastly different things, but connected at the same time. So um, I, I guess I, I was curious to see which side you wanted to discuss more, because I, I didn't get a sense of, did you want to talk about the patient side or did you want to talk about like discovery and development of new medicines that are more personalized in that sense? Um, thank you. Yeah, I think, I think a little bit of both. I think, um, and I think this is like a great transition to the next question of okay. then what, what do you think has been the biggest or um, advancements in the past couple of years that have led to the acceleration of the development of personalized approach in medicine, both from now the patient side and then from the uh, kind of precision 
side. Yeah, I'll take a start there. And I think that's a great point that was made because it's kind of like a three-part problem if you think of it, regardless of modality, whether it's a drug or it's a device, you need to have a treatment that works. You know, that's kind of stage one. And then stage two, you have to be able to get the treatment, find the patient that's there. And then the step three in the last part, you actually have to get it to them at the right time. And if you can't fulfill all of those three things, then you're not really actually treating or improving the patient outcomes and you're kind of failing the patient. You know, so whether it's like a CGM, which is a great example, which allows you to say, okay, now I'm monitoring the patient in real time and I can intervene and know when I need to intervene, you know, I'm able to actually deliver the care. But you could have a treatment, you can have insulin and you don't have a CGM on the patient and you don't know when the spiking has happened in their blood sugar levels, even though you have a treatment, you're not getting to the patient. And that kind of leads into like what I think some of the, the biggest changes we've seen recently that are enabling us to take a step forward is just the amount of data that we're able to create and generate, the amount of measurements we're able to take with different wearable devices, uh, with different advancements in data science to really, you know, enhance uh, the data collection we're doing and, you know, and leverage ML AI. And I think one of the you know, greatest events is just compute power. You know, the ability we've taken as far as our ability to make, you know, both supervised and unsupervised training models, you know, has taken a large leap that will, of course, now we have to kind of decipher and understand how to use that correctly and accurately so we don't have garbage in, garbage out. But it's definitely led to some exciting developments. So I uh, was reflecting on what was being said, and I very much agree with everything so far. Um, so as a clinician, I actually have this amazing privilege to see patients uh, who come through our individualized medicine clinic. So we do pharmacogenomic testing for them. Pharmacogenomic testing, for those who may not be familiar, essentially it's a type of a genetic test where we test the germline mutations, things that you have inherited from your ancestors or your parents. And those germline mutations have variations sometimes in them that can greatly impact protein expression. Why is that important in terms of drugs? Well, that's the crux of it. I mean, drugs utilize those systems um, to work. And so in the clinic, when we meet with patients, we do this pharmacogenomic testing and PGX in short um, has been kind of in a forefront of precision medicine or personalized medicine because it is the most widely validated and used one of the validated tools within the precision medicine toolkit. So when I think about, you know, what has been the biggest advancement in order to be able to do something like this, um, going back to, to, to previous, you know, I love in the past few years, I'm seeing this shift from the genotyping uh, based technologies where we're looking for already known mutations and we're saying, oh, you your normal metabolizer, for example, when indeed you may actually ne may not be because you carry some of those rare variants that are not found or not typically you know, uh, checked. And so we're going away from this genotype-based sequencing in the clinic into something like, uh, excuse me, genotype-based testing into sequenced testing. And um, the, one of the biggest advances really are even with, with understanding that genetic diversity, like, you know, we talk about the reference genome, there is no such thing yet as the reference genome. <laughs> the project is underway. Eventually, we're going to know a little bit more. But um, I, I definitely see that as one of the biggest advances and, of course, uh, the leveraging of the AI. I'd like to echo that response, actually. I think um, the routinization of sequencing um, in a wholesale bulk manner where, for example, at City of Hope now, there's a program to essentially sequence everybody who comes in uh, after consent and, and, and so on. But uh, to and, and there it's a uh, somatic sequencing, which is distinguished from germline. But um, to simply collect it all, then we can build. And, and that is the advancement where it becomes possible to do whole exome sequencing of everybody who comes in. You build this very rich data set. And then I'd say the second part of the, um, the recent breakthroughs or advances would be what to do with all of this data. And their uh, recent advances in unsupervised learning algorithms, I think, are, are, are most relevant. Uh, we, we simply need to grapple this extremely high dimensional data sets with very, very sparse labels because uh, physician time spent labeling is extremely scarce. 
Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I echo the same in, in that I think there is, uh, I guess, a couple of ways of thinking, thinking about it. There is maybe, there isn't maybe one cutting edge, but there is maybe several cutting edges when you, when you think about this, right? So on the patient side, certainly um, the genotyping, if you will, of the patients is very helpful. But then we also all have these cell phones that are always with us everywhere and collecting data, right? And I think that aspect, which is in some ways phenotyping is the way I see it, right? Is super, super helpful. I think on the medicine development side, uh, we see a lot of really amazing improvements in, in our ability to do machine learning, data generation. And I think part of that is actually just development of technologies that are giving us high quality data, like sequencing being one of them, but there are other ones where we get really high quality data sets that then are now enabling really great machine learning approaches that are also now um, much better than what we had, uh, like simple support vector machines like 10 years ago, we have much better systems now where we can analyze those data sets. And so that's the part we don't often see, which is the sort of molecular sort of engineering part that's now being informed by machine learning and AI. Uh, but I think both, both sides are equally exciting to me. Alborz, I'm just going to uh, comment really quickly. I love where you went with that, because when I think about the overall data, you know, patient, let's say specific data, only 10% is of that is uh, representative of the clinical data, like age, weight, disease states, things that I typically go through EMR when before I meet with the patient, right? right. But, you know, the other part of that is this genome data that we talked about, about 30 percent of that uh, relevance to overall outcomes is contributed to that uh, attributed to the genomic data. But the 60 percent of overall clinical outcome is actually attributed to social determinants of health. So, you know, the the. Uh, Digital transformation obviously has taken place across, but I see patients who come in exactly with what you said. Here is the apps that I have. Can you make sense of this? And then plug it into the algorithm that you already have that will give us the drug prediction, um, better drug prediction phenotype. And I think we are gonna see a lot more of that. Excellent. I, I really like you know, that you mentioned both now the advancements of molecular biology have led to, you know, this aggregation of data and this accumulation of data that we're now able to get from the patients. And with a lot of apps and, you know, um, just data that is, you know, currently getting monitored in the clinic, we have metrics for social determinants of health. But for scalable technologies to be built, in the personalized medicine or precision diagnostic space, you will have to really go beyond just one clinical site. And you will have to aggregate sort of the big data that you're getting across facilities, across different clinical sites. And there seems to be, you know, like a lot of barriers to that. And can you, any of you kind of speak to what you think some of the challenges are there with the big data aggregation for scalable tech? Well, this actually reminds me of something Vivek mentioned this morning in his keynote talk of um, the holy grail being a simply a consortium. Can all of these hospitals and medical centers pool their data in an anonymized, um, you know, uh, uh, properly protected way where we can just get the ultimate data set? And I, I think that's harder than artificial general intelligence to get humans to cooperate in that way. Um, the, you know, we, we, uh, jealously guard our data and you know with with i think uh, justifiable reasons um and yet you know well this is something that can be solved technologically once these kinds of federated privacy preserving machine learning algorithms are developed then uh there, there's less need to jealously protect and guard this this lifeblood of our operation um but even you know intra-organization i feel like our data sharing is a difficult proposition. So let alone cross organization. This is, uh, I think, a still much harder problem, a people problem versus a technical problem. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think I think this is a people challenge. It's not a technical challenge. We have the technology to aggregate all of these. And, and I mean, 
how many of us have our vaccination records on a platform? <laughs> so when you go to the doctor, they could just at a very basic level know what kind of vaccinations you have. Probably like very few of us have a platform where our doctor could see it immediately, right? And something as simple as that, we still don't have today, right? As a, as a unified platform. And uh, part, of, part of the barrier to that is, is people, uh, right? I mean, medicine is... Um, in some ways catching up on technology, right? And this is one of the ways that I think that we, there's definitely improvements we can make there. But I think in some other, some other ways, it's also a platforms um, issue where different doctors are just using different platforms and they have their own internal data, databases at their office. So when you go to your GP's office, they have their own whatever software it is that they're using that may or may not be compatible with a, with a unified platform. And so I think that's probably a challenge that we can overcome. Um, and, and there's got to be an incentive for people to do that. So I think we need to think about the incentives for, for, uh, for physicians to do that, the incentive for patients to do that. There's got to be a net plus plus for everyone in that ecosystem to be able to share the data. That's, I, I don't think people necessarily are, um, I, I mean, I don't, it depends on the person, but I don't think people are averse to sharing their data if they know it's protected and if they know that it's going to benefit them in the long run. I was going to say exactly that, Alvarez. I think the interoperability of data is still a significant uh, logistical issue and workflow issue, uh, almost regardless of what clinical setting you work in. And again, I'm taking a very biased uh, lens here because uh, that is my area of living or area of practice. Uh, patients are actually quite keen to share their, their data. As a matter of fact, they're coming in and saying, here it is, use it. Um, right. So it seems like that the, obviously the trust needs to exist. And one of the promising, I always, um, you know, I don't want to engage in toxic uh, positivity here in any way, but I always look at the silver lining or maybe positive trends. And one of the positive trends that I'm seeing lately is uh, the conversations are taking place um some like these coalitions that are popping up um just this uh, week or this month you may have heard about uh kind of moving forward with chai coalition which is essentially a coalition um uh, how to guide um e effectively and ethically um you know data use and ai ai and machine learning algorithms um, across these um, healthcare organizations. So, for example, the organization that I work for, Mayo Clinic, has partnered with John Hopkins, Duke, and other organizations. So these conversations and actually platforms um, on, on how to do this interoperability are already popping up. So there is some positive movement exactly there. Yeah, yeah and, and healthcare systems, uh, private healthcare systems, I think could be the first wave where we see the integration of data mm -hmm. and then hopefully those platforms over time can interact with each other so but i'm sure there are probably people in the audience that already have ideas and working on this and mm -hmm. uh, much better ideas than we've discussed so I'm, I'm really curious to know if there's people already i'm sure there are people working on it and, and so i'm i'm hopeful that uh, you know in, in our lifetime we'll see all of this coming together really nicely and actually advancing. I mean, I think that's going to be one of the biggest benefits to our health, being able to have that data set. Um, it's incredibly rich data sets that we could utilize to advance our health. Yeah, definitely echo with all the other panelists on how bureaucracy kind of ruins interoperability. You know, you, you mentioned having like one kind of data set you try to share with your doctor or you get one from each place. Or what about the 14 my charts I have from each doctor I've ever visited in my life? None of them talk to each other and I have to go to the doctor and like I'll, I'll log in and show you the data that you can't access even though you're providing care to me. Uh, and I'll take a little bit just a, another stance once we get past the human element. We do have a mass amount of data and a lot of these health systems, I've talked to several of them who were like, oh, we have this amazing data lake. And what they mean by that is I have a whole pool of unstructured data that is not organized in any way, shape or form. And then there's another opportunity for MLAI to come in and say, how do I actually make this usable so that it can actually be transferred and helpful and both help on the patient level where it makes things, you know, more predictive, you know, because our care right now is very reactionary, you know, in order to really make care predictive and prescriptive, we're not we don't have the manpower on a doctor wide even if you have the data fully accessible to do that you really need automation 
and you need technology to help there. And then it also helps reveal insights. So when you have data that's actually useful and usable, not just the quantity, but the quality of the data, then you can start doing things like drug discovery better, do patient bio uh, biomarker selection better. So there's a lot of opportunities and companies I see out there working to figure out ways to get past some of this bureaucracy and you know, figure out ways novelly to both incentivize you know, the partnerships to do it, not only on just the patient outcomes, but on a dollar basis, and then figure out really novel ways to leverage technology to automate and make these processes more efficient because it's impossible. We don't have the manpower now to provide regular care. You can't give more work to a doctor and say, oh, we gave you a bunch of more data to pour over and give better care to your patients. The data tsunami is not going to work. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Uh, I really you. like all of the points that you guys brought up. And I think what is also kind of a big question that I always think about is once we do get over this massive hurdle with data management and the infrastructure, there's also the problem that there are a lot of disparities in healthcare data. And now aggregating this data and this uh, into ML and AI algorithms, will we in precision medicine be contributing to um, the problem of healthcare inequality? I mean, I think healthcare data is great if you're a white European male, you know, between <laughs> ages of 20, but, you know, all jokes aside, yeah, that is a huge issue. And I think it's something that's still not at the forefront of a lot of people working in big data's minds, that just how easy it is to bias data and to not collect from all the available sources. And it's one of those problems, once again, that's very well addressed with technology. If you really think about it, it gives more access if you're able to automate processes to start saying, you know, where are my collection sites? What is the population I'm looking at to you? accurately weight and treat things in groups in the right ways appropriately, but it's like, it's a massive issue right now. We're not getting in on the clinical trial enrollment. We're not getting on the drug selection, like from every stage of the process, you know, these biases are already introduced and we really need to take a step back and start thinking of how to fix those problems. Yeah, I, I could add, I mean, there, there are people in the world that don't have bank accounts or credit cards, but they're able to do money transfers through cell phones. And so when you think about that, in some ways, technology can bypass some of the limits that we already have and actually remove some of the restrictions in terms of access. So I'm hopeful in that sense. But at the same time, even with existing therapies, we see a disparity in, in people's access to existing therapies that we have right now. So I think, I think that's a challenge, more of a society challenge that we need to address um, that not we don't necessarily we can't necessarily address it at the cutting edge of the technology because we really are just trying to develop these systems. But at the same time, I think that's more of a bigger issue that we all need to work on in terms of making sure that there is equality of access to these technologies. I was, I was going to give you an example, which I thought was amusing. I, I, I was surfing like two, two years ago and I had like a, I got hit by a surfboard. So I go to the hospital, get an MRI done to make sure that my head is okay. And uh, I wanted a copy of my uh, MRI. And so, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. They gave it to me on a CD. Like, when was the last time you saw a computer with a CD player that can actually look at this data, right? Like, I have to go to Amazon and order, like, one of these USB CD connectors that can actually retrieve the data from the CD. So I think that's, that's like, exemplifies the challenge like that we face in terms of getting high quality data from everyone and having it on one platform. And so when I saw that, I was thinking, you know, maybe the file storage companies are the first <laughs> first to actually be able to jump on this, right? Like Box or, you know, and, and kind of think about it. Because I know they have platforms that are compatible with, with uh, a lot of healthcare companies in a sense. So, so from that perspective, they already have the, you know, safe and secure sharing of files and all of those things. And Maybe that could be a vertical where a company comes in and says, we're going to now use that, right? But have a platform for all the physicians to be able to, you know, dump data into this sort of Dropbox for this person, right? And each person has kind of a, um, a secure ID that they could use. So I'm sure that's already happening and I probably don't know about it, but I just thought it was incredibly amusing that they gave me a CD with my MRI on it. Now, I, luckily, I was okay, but I, I thought that was really interesting. And I still haven't seen MRI because I don't have a CD player to read it with. So I, <laughs> I have a comment on Chris's um, actually very insightful semi-joke. Unfortunately, it is not a, it's not a, 
a joke. This is a fact. So I had a conversation just the other day with a colleague because both of us were catching up on what the NHGRI is doing, National um, Human Genomics Research um, Institute is doing. And one of the things that we really wanted to take a closer look at is how we define patient-specific data. Like if we're talking about the big data here in healthcare, I feel like, okay, volume is great, but I'm less concerned about maybe other Vs. I'm more concerned about veracity. Like, is this relevant? And how are we defining this? And how are we able to act on that? So one of these things that we looked at is how we define a race. Because we always say, you know, there is only one species, hum you know, homo sapiens. There are no races. Yet, whenever you go fill out any medical form or health questionnaire, they will ask you, what is your race? And so the conversation is actively taking place even, how do we collect that? And to steer away from this race-based system to ancestry-based system, why is that important? Because there is a very active ancestry-driven drug discovery going on right now. It actually has been going on for, for, for a bit. But this is going to also be important in terms of, you know, stratifying where the patient is at and how do we uh, understand biology and how do we treat the condition, including chronic diseases, which, you know, we're talking about multi-omic, multi um, you know, platforms here, not just genomics. So we're adding other layers, proteomics, microbiome, and all these huge data sets that are going to really drive the future of medicine. Yeah, I'll make one last comment. I thought you were going to differ with your joke about the MRI, but to add on to like how unsupervised learning can be problematic, you know, there was a study showing that from MRIs only with no uh, kind of demographic information, you could predict if someone was female or male. And this was like a revelation that we've created an ally. It's completely accurate. It can diagnose sex just from the, the MRI scan of the brain. Therefore, there must be a difference between men and women. Well, what had actually happened was there was a watermark from the scanner at the bottom that they had not noticed that that was what's predicting it. And there was a selection bias there. So every time we use these unsupervised learning, you know, it's just a tool. It's not perfect. It's not God. You know, it's very much easily biased. And, you know, in a perfect world, you know, we can get more towards, you know, really personalizing and getting to that level of medicine where you can look at someone's, you know, kind of genotypic and phenotypic and really address who they are without, you know, some of the... Uh, the other concerns of their race, but we're just not down to that sophistication level. So it's very crucial to keep that in mind as we build these MLA and I and these big data approaches. Uh, that brings up an interesting point that there are, um, I mean, it, it brings up the point of the interpretability of whatever conclusions your machine learning model has, has drawn. And is it, um, if it's completely uninterpretable, you might go ahead with that model, never understanding that it made its decision based on this artifact, this watermark. Um, but then again, you know, there are biological differences that can be reliably detected, but when they don't come with um, interpretations or explanations, that's where you can run into trouble. And that is really where you run into resistance by the physician who you're trying to convince to use or, or to sell to, um, they cannot accept, uh, uh, you know, at, uh, your word for it. They need to be able to interpret the results of the model that you've built and trained and, and given to them. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, you, you can tell apart uh, Western genetic ancestry and Eastern genetic ancestry brain MRIs. There's like brachycephalic and dolichocephalic. So there are different brain shapes. They're generalizations. They're not specific to everybody. Um, uh, oh, but th there was one more. You brought up the question initially of unequal access to a health care. And um, one way around this is, I think, to perform indiscriminate sampling of everybody who comes to your hospital. Everybody of every race gets sick eventually. Everybody gets cancer. Um, if, but, but not everybody has the wherewithal to uh, know about clinical trials that they may be eligible for. If you open your program and you will commit to funding a program that will perform sequence for everybody who walks through and offer it to them, that is one way to you know, make a dent in this unequal access problem. 
Um, I really do agree with that. And I feel like a lot of, um, specifically in the oncology space, um, uh, I know that a lot of clinics are making strides in making sure that, um, you know, we have fair sampling in accordance with like the disease type uh, from different populations and to kind of try to get over this massive uh, issue of healthcare inequality. Um, and this kind of brings me to my next kind of point where I feel like there has been a lot of advancement in the field of personalized medicine and you know precision therapeutics and diagnostics with the onset of now we have Garten, we have you know Grail, um, and then we have you know a lot of immunotherapy uh, within the oncology space. Uh, but what are some other areas where you think, uh, you know, disease areas that may be underserved right now, under-targeted, but that can greatly benefit from a more personalized approach? Oh, this is a tough one, so. <laughs> I wanted to give our clinicians a chance to speak to their most, but. <laughs> I'll uh, thank you very much because I have a strong, strong opinion about that. <laughs> So great question where we are seeing this uh, kind of <clears throat> doubling down of efforts are across uh, chronic, dis chronic disease uh, areas. So things like, you know, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases. Um, I'm going to maybe just um, put things in perspective a little bit. We are also seeing significant increase in autoimmune diseases. And we know that women are especially are at the increased risk of autoimmune diseases. I mean, we have two X chromosomes and a lot of them are kind of, if you will, um, influenced by that. Uh, we also know that specific ancestry groups will carry, will have an increased risk of autoimmune disease. There was actually a publication, I think, just this week that showed that if your ancestors survived a black plague, you know, black death, I should say, a plague, that you have what protected you then or what protected your ancestors then now actually increases your risk of autoimmune diseases. So there is a significant focus on that. And I am in clinic to be very specific. I'm seeing it in psychiatry, neurology, and you know the diseases that I mentioned, and also better understanding of these rare diseases, which you know, when you start to, to gain insights may not that be that rare as we consider them. Like for example, hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, I see a lot of female patients in my clinic. They all have, you know, drug intolerances, which are not driven by these pharmacogenes that we typically see. They, they seem to be driven by the condition itself, mass cell activation and dysautonomias and things like that. So glad you said autoimmune, because that's one, Really, if you think about it, as I said, oncology like, kind of always spearheads the way in some of the development and how we allocate resources, just given the size of the market and the prevalence. Uh, but when you think about, you know, the need for developing these tools, where it's our precision genomics, you know, getting down to the RNA level, single cell RNA seq that we developed for uh, oncology, it really works well for things like autoimmune, which are also heterogeneous diseases. You have different cell types, you have different uh, aspects that are occurring all the time, and you need higher resolution essentially because whereas the time points for cancer are a lot more you know like mediated it's a stage one it's stage two it grows at this level when you have an autoimmune disease you know you have waxing and waning over days weeks you can be an active flare and your cell types and some of the drivers of the disease are very present but i can measure that same person a month later where they're happy they're healthy they're feeling great and all of a sudden the signals become a lot more blurred or harder to identify so I think a lot of the tools that we've used now and the ability to collect, you know, much more measurements faster are going to allow us to have a lot more impact in autoimmune diseases and to really start targeting what are the causal types, what are the causal mechanisms, and what are the cell types? Because it's going to be very specific. It may be a specific population of B cells at time point A, and then we're able to ideally in the perfect world predict in and before it becomes a flare, maybe we can stop flares or at least not be just treating the symptoms and have an actual addressal of the cause. So there's a lot of opportunity there and we've seen amazing things. You know, recently we just saw uh, data showing lupus going to remission with CAR T therapy and CAR T started off in oncology. So it's once again showing how looking at a disease population like that is translated to findings in other disease populations. And then love rare disease, you know, 80% of rare diseases are usually genetic based and a large percentage of that 
is monogenic, which means there's just one gene change that you can really draw back to for mechanism. So we're going to see a lot of opportunities going from that to actually treat and impact populations, which because they're selected against have debilitating diseases, which are really terrible. And we're going to be able to improve outcomes there. And then the hope is maybe there'll be more of these rare diseases that translate the finding for broader population and more common diseases, something like a PCSK9, which we use for hypertension. You know, there might be other diseases that it might actually be able to treat uh, in different populations. So very exciting to see how the advancement in technology is going to lead to those. And I think it's also telling to see that pharma, like if you look at the pharma space as well, where their interest uh, has been, and it's exactly reflective of what you said, Chris. Yeah, maybe I'll mention an area where we don't have personalization being helpful at the moment, where I, I feel like it could be really helpful is in psychiatric disorders, where, um, you know, on the one hand, we have molecular modalities that essentially soak the entire brain in that molecule. So on, on, on the one hand, you don't really have personalization. And unfortunately, that's where it actually would be incredibly helpful to have personalized approaches where uh, you have medicines that are um, more tailored towards the conditions that are spectrum diseases. Uh, so on the one hand, you have the, the development of those, which I think could be a lot better and hopefully will be better in the future. And then on the other hand, you also have the better characterization of the spectrum of that disease and sometimes overlapping diseases, particularly in, in, in psychiatric disorders, where that will be more and more prevalent for all of us. I, I'm, you know, we all have some psychiatric disorders. We just don't know, and we're in somewhere in that spectrum. And you know, some have more of one and less of the other. But I think in general, like that's we, we are going to live longer. People are going to have, you know, many more years to their life where they have to deal with, you know, stress and and various things that come up in life. And those psychiatric disorders right now are being treated with, you know, drugs that are incredibly better than what we had 50 years ago. But at the same time, they're not really personalized in the way that they're used or developed. So I think that's an area where if I were to put my finger on one neglected area where there could be huge improvements in, in how we develop medicines and also utilize medicines, I, I think psychiatric disorders would be one. I think that's going to require a significant shift in thinking because clinically, what do we have? We have these diagnosis codes, which are not reflective essentially of the biology. So I totally agree with what you said there, but it's going to require a shift in education, shift in thinking, and uh, hopefully then shift in terms of therapeutics as well. I mean, we're all already seeing some improvements in that space, but we're a long ways from... Um, from really being there. Yeah, and, and I think that's a, that is a big challenge for our generation is both the molecular identification and stratification of these diseases and then also modalities that, that are personalized to those. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've had a, an incredibly well-rounded discussion around kind of what are the challenges? Now, what are some of the opportunities? Now, I think what can key players in the biotech ecosystem, and I think it's wonderful that we have this panel here. You know, we have like a research hospital, you know, we have venture capital, we have industry, and we have, you know, a physician. Um, what are some of the roles that people in the biotech ecosystem can play now to accelerate the development and um, kind of the progress within the precision um, therapeutics treatment and personalized medicine space? I think the answer to this uh, connects with the prior response where um, Albor has pointed out that we still lack a precision medicine approach to psychiatric disorders. And what that really means is the real barrier to personalization or precision is mechanistic insight of the, the molecular mechanisms driving the disease. I think the biggest barrier there is um, scientific. We simply don't know enough fundamental science about the, about the brain for sure, but also all of the dis diseases that, for which we still lack precision therapies. 
we don't understand their genetic basis and their molecular basis yet. So from the research side, I would say is just that basic science need is still very deep. So I, maybe I was going to suggest science education because, you know, I, I think that's to me, that's an area where I'm really worried about in terms of really young people today. Um, you know, how do we do science education better? And how do we train people to be good scientists? And um, and I think that the the education system we have might actually need a, a little bit of updating in terms of how people learn. Uh, we have people that are able to go on, watch a YouTube video and learn so much from that YouTube video, and not have to sit at a lecture. So I think I think having really a sort of a rethinking of how we do education and, and give access. I think that's that's the other part where we see you mentioned disparities in access. I think that's an area where we really could improve. So it's not so much working on healthcare itself, but working on people who are going to be the leaders for healthcare and who are going to be great scientists. And I, I see, at least in, in our country, I, I worry about the development of great scientists and, and you know, and, and the um, and the need for them long term, instead of, I guess, uh, this uh, globalized approach to doing science, where a lot of it is done offshore. So I worry about that, and having great scientists. You know, I just think of analytical chemists, right? Um, I worry about that because I see young kids being a lot more infatuated with, you know, Instagram, and you know, someone on Instagram. Uh, versus a great scientist. And so I think from that perspective, I, I wonder if there we can do better in terms of promoting science and, and and having that be one of the value systems that we use in our society to really uh, to drive people towards that uh, versus, you know, I, I, I don't think it's it's at all bad to strive to be a, a you know, a professional athlete, for example. That's great. But I also think we should be striving uh, to to motivate people to be great scientists and and technology developers etc. So I, I that's not really a challenge we can address, but I just I think that's something that would really help in the long run for for our efforts. So Alborz, I got to tell you, I love what you commented on. So as an educator, I I you know teach medical school pharmacy students, medical students, residents, and so on. And for a um, couple of years. Um, we have been working on ways to maybe gamify some of these lectures and utilize, you know, virtual reality, which we do actually virtual reality and, you know, metaverse space that has ex been exploding and so on. So I do think empowerment um, is important. Empowerment for providers, for all of the five P's, the patient, the provider, the payer, the product, um, you know, maker and all of that. But I'm a patient centric person. So I always think about what can we do right now? It's great that we have all of this technology. It's great. We're talking about deep learning, machine learning and all of that. But you know, when I think about, um, I'm a one trick pony. I only look at the drugs. <laughs> so when I think about drugs, drugs are a fourth leading cause of death in this country. There are over a hundred thousand people who die out due to adverse drug events in United States alone every year. Two million hospitalizations are attributed to, to that um, uh, ad those adverse drug events. So how about building products and platforms that can gre give greater um, empower empowerment to the patients to report some of these things? Also give them greater access to education when it comes to like drug-related or condition-related education in a way that maybe we can leverage even gamifying. And we have seen examples of that across, um, you know, different categories of drugs, and um, and also um, really have this data perhaps maybe work on something that can have this data uh, interoperable because that's one of my biggest pressure points as a clinician. I have a lot of data. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know where to plug it through. Can we make it seamless? Like as opposed to having a phone that I have a bunch of apps on my phone that I don't use. That essentially is what's happening with these patients as well. Yeah, I was, I echo those points. I think collaboration is important. Like, you know, empowering the patients we saw in this pandemic, how, you know, 
what was out there for patients to educate themselves on, you know, what were the right things? What would I need to be concerned about? The vaccines. We saw how fraud our system was and why we need that's important to give patients the right tools to find kind of the treatment options, the ideas. And, and it's not that they don't want to make it, but if they're inundated, they don't have the medical backgrounds and if they don't know who to trust, if there's a doctor that says don't ever take a vaccine, that's a credible source to them in their mind. So we definitely need to empower everyone to make the right decisions and do a better job of educating our populace. And I think we all need to work together as far as the interoperability and work. You know, me as an investor, you know, I think I need to collaborate and work well with the clinicians, you know, here and understand their needs so that I'm not funding companies that don't actually solve their problems. Because it's not helpful for me to fund or for them if I fund the 80, 80th million app solution, you know, they, they have to use to treat their patients and it's not actually providing better outcomes. You know, the researchers have to work together, you know, when how to share their information so that they can combine a larger pool of data to provide more valuable insights. So I think collaboration is going to be important outside of just understanding the science, doing the bench work and enhancing our knowledge there. There's more near term things in these goals we just outlined that we can really put more power behind today to actually drive impact. Hi, my name is Matias. Um, quick question for everybody here. We talk about personalized medicine always on the back end in terms of treatment perspective, um, whether it's immunotherapy, you know, radiogenomics, et cetera, on that line. What's been the barrier from taking personalized medicine and bringing it to a proactive leading indicator approach? What I mean by that is I go and get my CBC done and I'm compared to a reference range. How is that range established? How does it take me as a person into context? Further, how can I make a longitudinal approach to my personal medicine so that I can ha have agency and autonomy on my medical decisions to prevent, you know, maybe some down the line approaches, diabetes was mentioned. Um, I personally don't know my hemoglobin A1C, nor do I know how it's changed over the course of 10 years of my life. Right. Um, right. How can we get in front of it rather than behind it? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And uh, I, I think you, you pointed to one of the problems we have today, which is we have this sort of, uh, you know, um, very binary events when you do a blood test, for example, right? Is your, you know, hemoglobin A1C within range or outside of range? That's kind of how we look at it, right? Or, you know, if you do a, any of the blood markers. And, and what's probably a lot more informative is what was it last year and the year before and the year before that, and what's the trajectory of it? And so even though it may still be within range, it may be heading in a direction that's not ideal, right? I think that's what you're getting at, right? And can we have systems that are proactively seeing that and telling us if something wrong is happening? So I think in order to have that, we do need to have systems that can communicate with each other and a platform where data is available for, for these uh, sort of analytical methodologies that you described where, you know, a machine learning approach could be used on the data set, right? And I think the challenge right now is we have these islands of data sets and some of them aren't even islands, they're just a physician and their office, right? And whatever data system they're using. Um, and they, there isn't really a common platform. And so I think that that is probably one of the challenges I see in getting to where you're, you mentioned in terms of uh, proactive systems. So I was going to, um, I think this is a really insightful question that you ask, and I'm sorry, I forgot your name already, <laughs> but thank you for asking it. It brings to the forefront what the whole, this whole session really here is about. We are not there yet, obviously. And I think I agree with Albers, uh, we're gonna work, and this work is underway anyway, we're gonna work on building pipelines and platforms, and hopefully they will be interoperable, where if you go to Italy or if you go to US or wherever you might be, uh, those systems actually will be able to communicate and share the data. So what you're talking about really here is this multi-omics approach to self that will be able to 
basically capture trends that are seen in others and then tell you, you know what, um, whatever your name is, I'm sorry again, but you have 47% chance of developing this or that. And here is the treatment strategy that we will deploy or preventative strategy, really. Let's not talk about the treatment. We're, we're now in a space of preventative medicine and curative medicine, which is what personalized medicine actually is about. Where we are right now, we are at the precision medicine point. What you are asking is personalized medicine uh, front. And so I just really wanted to commend you on asking that question and wanted to briefly echo on the, the previous comments. Actually quite hopeful on the uh, transition to uh, proactive uh, interventions in healthcare. Um, this, we are getting towards personalized omics and even personalized microbiome. I, I think CES last year, they showed a, a thing where you can take samples of your own stool regularly, and then you send it into the lab and they do the panel on it, and it continues glucose monitoring and the Apple Watch. I think we're, we're turning over now where it's going to become routine, and why wouldn't you keep track of your health longitudinally? Uh, I'm, I'm, so yeah, I think it's heading in the right direction. I think you mentioned a good point there. It's really like patient driven. So like patients have a desire to have their data and understand themselves. So like all the solutions you're seeing right now are like at home test kits that you order. And it hasn't really gotten to the point of really direct streamlined communication with your provider, with your doctor. So like your question is apt. It's like if I have all these measures myself, is there a person in the system that's actually looking at all of it? Or are they all seeing snapshots and they're making a decision based on that snapshot? And I've gone through exactly your situation with my own blood work on the CBC panel where I have, <laughs> yeah, for many years I had a low white blood cell count that was outside of the range. And I had been taking them back since like 2015, but I had several different my charts, each of them with different snapshots and ranges and no access between my care provider. And it, sometimes you'll get a care provider who's more bullish and works harder to do. And some will just kind of write it off and not look at it. But eventually, you know, maybe 10 years later, get to a care provider and say, this has kind of always been low. Is that normal? And then they'd be like, oh, well, I can't access, even though it's at a UC provider, your Cedars, you know, data that you got last year, even though this is literally down the street from each other. And I have to bring out my own my chart from back when, you know, seven years ago. And I'm showing the doctor the data to kind of confirm and say, OK, maybe we should follow into this. So the idea in a perfect healthcare system where we have interoperability is that wouldn't be so hard. It would be right up front. And then you would you as you know Arvad said you would say hey the direction is changing or not right away rather than waiting seven years to get to the right doctor and then it actually becomes a problem and that's when care is more expensive if you treat care earlier and you actually provide it it's usually easier it's more effective if you wait until you know the shit hit the fan part of my friend it's always the most expensive and the outcomes are the worst. And you know, for those who are entrepreneurial minded in the audience, um, this is a huge gap that is going to continue to widen as far as being having somebody who will be yours health or wellness companion. And so, you know, there are ways to fill in that gap either through, you know, your digital twin journey or maybe a service or a product that can help you uh, communicate all of this, but not only communicate, pull it all in together um, and uh, and have that data readily available, re regardless of where you are. So, thank you. Uh, my name is Owen. I, uh, I'm actually really grateful that you guys were talking about diabetes. Um, I uh, work on behalf of a therapy company called uh, Tandem Diabetes. And uh, we manufacture uh, type, uh, insulin pumps, insulin pump therapy. So, uh, my question is actually, you know, we're, we're looking into a lot of interesting opportunities in the precision medicine and medicine space. Um, I actually have a philosophical question about how personalized is personalized enough? Because I'm thinking about our patients who are in type 1 and type 2 who have to make 10, 20,000 different decisions every day, counting carbs, looking at what they're eating. How do you determine that success criteria when you got there and it's no longer, um, and it's not adding burden by being more and more personalized over time? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I guess maybe I can take this one because I work on insulin <laughs> and the, the company that I developed for technologies, uh, the idea that 
we worked on, which Lily eventually acquired, is to develop a glucose sensing insulin. So it, it we, we actually engineered the drug itself to sense your blood sugar level and modulate its activity automatically. So all the sensing and the, the, the device functionalities are actually built into the molecular engineering of the of the drug itself, and it can actually respond dynamically to blood sugar levels, which one could argue is a personalized way of doing things because it's always responsive to what your body's needs are. But I think the, the question you ask is, what are the metrics that we use? And I guess when it comes to insulin or in the, you know, in the case of Tandem, I'm sure you guys will look at timing range, which is one of the things that we measure. It's not a clinical sort of, um, you know, it's not an endpoint necessarily because we typically look at A1Cs, but timing range could be a great way to tell if, if that, the, the course of therapy is ideal for that person. Um, I think another really great measure that we don't necessarily right now look at is how energized does the person feel? And, and how, you know, um, are they feeling like they have nocturnal hypoglycemia, for example, and in the morning, are they feeling more of that? So I think those are more of the kind of the personalized aspects of, of, of uh, diabetes healthcare that I think are important. But I think there was a, also a point mentioned, which is patients are the drivers of a lot of these things. And I think in the case of pumps, that's definitely the case where we see them actually looking and buying some of these old pumps and actually adapting them to the systems that they like to have, which I think is, you know, I can't comment on whether that's safe or not, but I think it's it's really incredible how motivated patients are uh, to, to take control of their health. It's a really interesting question you ask because it really goes to which treatment, which indication, and like what the answer you're going for. Because like in the case of, like you said, for tandem diabetes, like, yeah, maybe it is those things like time and range, energy levels. In the case of if you think of like antidepressants, you know, there's wildly different, you know, reactions to different antidepressants for different populations. And you can be on one that gets rid of your depressive symptoms, but makes you feel worse in other ways. And therefore, just using that as a metric of like, okay, we personalize it, you no longer feel depressed, but it's like, oh, you feel like a zombie, and you don't like it. You know, you have to pick the right points that make sure that the outcome gets you all the desired results and all the aspects that are crucial for that patient. Um, thanks for this great discussion. So I've been in the industry for 22 years. I'm actually a clinical PhD. And um, one of the things is, is the frustration of, you know, I do a lot of patient advocacy and a lot of patients me and their insurance won't cover the testing that I'm recommending. Even the basic that we think it's basic, you know, they won't cover it. And so this payer issue, I was also a diagnostic laboratory director many years ago. So this payer issue has continued through, I started with Dennis Lehman, um, my career, and I don't see it getting better, honestly, you know, and the more advanced we're getting with our technologies, I feel like the more resistance we're facing from the payers, and, um, you know, if it's not a CBC, and it's a little bit more complicated than that, you know, page, most people don't have access in, in the United States. They don't have access to care they don't have access to testing and if they have access to testing you know i decided to become a consultant last year and you know paying fifteen hundred dollars a month for health insurance is insane it's absolutely insane so how many people can afford fifteen hundred dollars a month for health insurance so we are all of us are you know working so hard to bring these technologies to the forefront but how are how can we i know it's a maybe a mood question how can we expand access to patients and also i don't know get together and force these payers to cover you know so, at least some of these advanced technologies that in all honesty 10 years later they're not even that advanced anymore in my opinion so i can maybe no, take that <laughs> I can take that one really briefly here. So you ask an excellent question. I actually was just on the phone with a third party that I will not name uh, this morning for a patient who got the repeatedly declined access 
uh, or coverage rather, I should say, for the pharmacogenomic testing, which a lot of times actually is covered in comparison to other genetic tests, which may be considered more exploratory. This is more of the clinical grade. And so um, one thing that I'm seeing is the way to expand access is actually to partner up with some of the payers. And we are seeing that in respect of, let's say, pharmacogenomic testing specifically. So these large uh, payer groups um, <clears throat> where we um, have testing provided to their employees, for example, and then this you know how it works. It's cost effectiveness study. What's the bottom line to all of this? And will that really move the needle in that positive way to say that the test will now be started um, uh, to be covered rather in future? Maybe I'll mention quickly um, that if you look at uh, pharmaceutical industry and biotechnology industry, uh, there are many players in this industry and it's not dominated by, by any single player. Which is, which is a sign of a very healthy industry in the sense that you don't have very dominant players, that there are even some of the biggest companies only have very small market shares in certain overall in the market, right? But when you look at the other side of it, which is the payers and, and the, the insurance systems, it's a complete different story. And not to comment negatively on them, but I, I think, you know, I, I think the biotechnology and the pharmaceutical industry actually does incredibly incredible good for the world in, in terms of coming up with medicines that that save lives but on the other hand you mentioned that you you know paying fifteen hundred dollars for insurance just seems you know that's just not sustainable for for our society so i i don't know if i have the solutions to that but i i'll just put in my plug that i i think that the, actually in some ways unfortunately we end up getting the bad reputation in the sense that the pharmaceutical industries are you know, they're, they're charging these prices for so many drugs, but that's actually, um, if you look at the total picture, um, almost all the good, a lot of the good is being done by developing these pharmaceutical drugs and the research and development that's being done. So I think, I think we need to have a holistic view, right, of, of the whole system. And a lot of that is the, the payers and the insurances that, that are the bigger picture, I think, in my view of, of what you just mentioned. I had a kind of flip answer to your question of how do you get the payers to pay and cover these tests. And that is simply to make the test better, to make them work better. And then the value will be so obvious that they'll be asking the patients to go and proactively get all these assays done. The truth is we're, it's still such an immature technology at this moment where the, the majority of all of the, um, the, the sequencing that we do come up with no variants that are actionable for these patients. So, uh, you know, as a research project, the hospital foots the bill for this indiscriminate testing, but we find out that the majority of the patients uh, would not have helped. But what that means is not that they lack mutations, but that uh, they're not actionable. So that is a, um, a, a shortage of our knowledge and um, medical progress, really. So once, once it becomes more mature, once personalization becomes a reality, I think they'll be, uh, they'll be the ones pushing for people to get tested and they'll happily pay for these uh, tests. Yeah, to expand on King's point and to be a little bit glib about it, the only way you're going to get payers to change their minds is on the economic case and to show them they made money. Uh, but the only problem with that is our ability to track and tie back outcomes to the decisions uh, to adapt new technology are really so far behind that they have a hard time tracking. And when you, you, you know, like kind of like it's hypothetically you say like this does this and should save you this much money per patient. Like how could you not do this? This will save you reduce surgery burdens or it will prevent this. Like this will make you money. But in their minds are like, I want to see it in my population. I got to see it in this subset. And I have to see one to five year data results to prove it to me that the money is actually there. And right now there's some even indications that that's not really feasible. If you think of things like mental health and how to move to value-based care, they have no idea how to even track what that means to, for outcomes and improvements. So I think that's where technology has a, a realm to play there by being able to generate data and get access and kind of, I would say, deconvolute it quicker. You know, we'll be able to hopefully prove the payers faster that they make money. Because the only way you're going to change their decision making is like, oh, this will make us money. Every patient needs to be on this first line uh, because we're going to spend less money overall. Because that's really all they care about, unfortunately.
I do agree with us that, you know, pharma gets a bad rep, but payers are pretty terrible too. Maybe, maybe I'll make a suggestion, become a politician and help uh, with, with, you know, policy because that really helps. If you're a scientist and you have a good understanding of science, uh, getting involved with policy is a great idea because I, I think we need that uh, for really having a thriving uh, ecosystem and, and all the beautiful innovations that we're seeing in, in biotech te technology and pharmaceutical industry. Hello. Hi, my name is Tang. I'm a third year pharmacy student at the USC School of Pharmacy. And um, I had a question regarding, um, and we alluded to it a little bit earlier, but we talked a little bit about personalized medicine. We talked about, you know, like, you know, mobile apps coming in and really um, preventive medicine, right? Um, but I was wondering, a lot of that as more tech uh, enters, you know, the health spaces, um, is it FDA approved? You know, uh, I go to my doctor and I know that my, my information is HIPAA. Uh, bound and it's it's private and so if I'm entering my data regularly say on a weekly monthly basis because I know that you know maybe diabetes or cancer runs in my family and so I'm tracking certain things um, who is protecting that data and is that data viable right can can another private company buy my data on a mobile app that hasn't been um, you know, HIPAA certified or approved yet. And I think that as we continue to have these conversations, I'm just curious what your take on that is um, from a patient consumer side. Um, and as, you know, future um, clinicians or scientists or um, the engineers in the room. And so what is, you know, your take on that? Well, I guess maybe I'll answer quickly. You should own the data. The question really is where is the data stored and who has access to it? So you could still be the owner, but other people can have access. Those are two very different things, mm -hmm. right? So t technically you're the owner of the data, but if you consent to it being used, then it doesn't matter. You may be the owner, but still they're, they're gonna be able to use it. So I think to me, those are, it's more the access, who has access to the data rather than who really owns the data. So, um, I don't know, maybe the other panelists have a different view on that, but I'm, I'm, I'm like a fully open person when it comes to data, personalized data in my perspective. I like everybody to have all the data that I have, right? Because I'm hoping it will give more benefit to me in the long run, so. You know, I don't have a very good insight on that because I'm struggling with that myself still. So um, there was a report that, again, I'm talking about publications a lot in this talk here, but. FDA just published updated list of all of the digital devices, um, so digital health related devices. And I, don't quote me on this because I was trying to pull it up as we were talking, couldn't find it right now. But I think there are over 150 of them that have been now approved. So this space is exploding in terms of innovation, although there are still guardrails when it comes to FDA's, you know, check mark and approval ultimately so in a way that's okay that's good and not that great at once the other thing is you know um and i don't know if this is really part of your question or not but something definitely to consider because it just came up again in a consult today um i was talking to a patient about the whole exome sequencing study i'm a co-investigator of a study we want to look not we want to look at all of the genes that, and look at all of the mutations and see if we can predict drug response phenotypes. And we were talking about that study and she's like, well, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that I want to do it because can that information be used against me? We are protected under GINA, um, you know, Genomic Information Protection Act, but it protects you when it comes to your health insurance. It does not necessarily protect you when it comes to, let's say, like life insurance. So this is a, a you know, consideration as well. I'm sorry that I'm not giving much of an insight as far as the digital tech space, but I'm a keen learner in that space myself. I should also probably mention the comments I made are my personal views and not one of the company <laughs> that I work for, which might be helpful. But, uh, you know, I, I think there is people have different philosophies and we also have to be respectful of how they view the world. And 
hopefully we can develop technologies that are respectful to all the different worldviews that people have and the philosophies of how they think data should be shared and accessed. Interesting, because as scientists, I think we're generally a more liberal population, but there's, right. I think, a little bit of a, you know, right. a split there, a dichotomy, because we, we love data. We think data makes decisions. So like for me as a scientist, I'm like, yeah, we should all be sequenced. We should all use that. And then if we come in, we'll get better care. And then we'll get better care for everyone because we have a massive set of data. But I understand that you know everyone has different worldviews, and it's something that you have to consent to. And from the digital side, I will say, like, it is kind of like a popular thing. And it's been so since I think the 23 and me days to be like, I'm going to collect these patients data and then I'm going to sell it to somebody else. And that's still going on. Everyone is still pitching like, oh, think of the data we can use. We're taking this data from patients and health systems have data, too, that they are sharing, you know, with different players, whether it be pharma, whether it be someone else. Uh, and a lot of it kind of stems to like on your point about the HIPAA and the protections. Uh, that it has to be de-identified. So that's usually a big thing as far as the companies you're seeing today that are working in those spaces with health systems. Like, you know, the first part of their engine is like, you have to have a great de-identification engine so none of the data is traceable to you specifically. But I get all the phenotypes and the measurements and the basic information clinically that I could use to make insights and such. But even that's going to get murkier because there's been a lot of talk of implementing more GDPR-like regulations here, and that's on the table. And then what happens then when you say, I don't want to consent anymore, and this hospital system already had my data and was trying to sell it? And then how does it go forward and do the transactions where they start sharing data? It's going to be an interesting time, I think, in the next five to 10 years, but it's a very valid question and a very excellent one. All right, well, that is a wrap. Thank you. Can we give a round of applause for our esteemed panel? What an amazing way to end this entire beautiful day. And so thank you all to our speakers, to our participants. And then uh, right now we're going to go into a reception.